Uh, right now we have a great presentation from Jose on congestion management. Good morning. Good morning to everybody. How you have recovered from the fantastic dinner last night. So, uh, well, this is the, the title of the, the presentation. I'm going to talk about congestion management in lossless interconnect, and I would like to highlight the word lossless, because you know that there has been a lot of research and practical experience in uh, lossy networks, like uh, Ethernet and other technologies. However, the fact that it's not allowed to drop packets completely changed the landscape, and most of the techniques that have been developed for lossy networks don't really work well on, on lossless networks. And this is why we need to develop research on, on this topic and find a solution that's really scalable. So I'm going to talk about that, about the, the first the benefits of implementing congestion management in, in current interconnects, and also about the challenges and how to address them. This is the outline of the, the presentation. First, uh, I will I will introduce uh, uh, some concepts, including why congestion management is required, uh, what are the benefits of congestion management, uh, what are the strategies uh, proposed so far, what are the challenges, and then some techniques to first improve existing uh, strategies for congestion management, and later uh, new techniques that have uh, interesting properties and techniques that can be combined with existing ones to deliver possibly the, the best of both worlds. So, uh, if we analyze the, the role of interconnection networks, we find out that for several decades, the interconnection network has not been the bottleneck. Computer architects uh, try to keep the processors busy, feeding them with uh, instructions and data so that they could process at the maximum speed in order to achieve top performance. And the interconnects were not the most expensive part of the machine. Indeed, uh, it was possible to achieve higher bandwidth with relatively little additional cost, and therefore those interconnects have not been the bottleneck. However, the situation is changing. If you look, for instance, at the uh, top one uh, supercomputer, uh, TN1A, uh, you will realize that indeed it uses uh, commodity processors, commodity GPUs, commodity memory, commodity disks, but a proprietary interconnect. And the reason is that they needed higher bandwidth, they needed lower latency in order to achieve performance. So the landscape is changing, at least for uh, top machines, the interconnect is, is a critical component. Indeed, if, if we consider the role of the interconnect, the, the interconnection network is between different processes running on different processors. And in order to, to make them run efficiently in parallel, we need to minimize latency so that as soon as some uh, results are computed by a process, could be directly sent to another process with minimal latency so that they don't need to wait for data to arrive. So this is critical. And if we talk about uh, bandwidth, well, bandwidth is, is not that important as long as we got enough of it. Because if, if we run short of bandwidth, then the problem is that uh, uh, packets start to accumulate in buffers and latency increases dramatically by orders of magnitude. And then uh, bandwidth is absolutely necessary. We don't need excess bandwidth, but we need at least the bandwidth required for packets to move around without a dramatically increasing latency. So the consequence of this is that we have to design the interconnection network in such a way that saturation is avoided. Because if, if saturation is reached, then latency would increase by orders of magnitude. So this is very important. So talking about saturation, uh, there are several ways of avoiding saturation. The traditional way has been to overdimension the interconnection network. So if we overprovision the interconnection network so that it has extra bandwidth, we don't have any, any problem really because uh, there is plenty of bandwidth, uh, packets can be transmitted at any time and they will be delivered with minimal latency at the destination. However, the situation is changing because the cost of the interconnect, as we'll see later, is increasing faster than the cost of the remaining components in, in the machine, or at least some of the components. And because of this, it's no longer a good idea to overdimension the interconnection network. So if we don't overdimension the, the interconnection network, then there is an increasing danger of reaching saturation, at least during short periods of time. Because you know that the traffic, uh, the network traffic is not uniform. If we had uniform traffic, 
that would be fantastic because we measure the traffic for a certain kind of applications and we dimension the interconnection network specifically for that amount of traffic. But this is not the case. Traffic is usually bursty. And there are some uh, programming models that uh, overemphasize this. For instance, uh, BSP, where uh, bulk synchronous programming, where you basically have several compute steps followed by communication steps. In that case, you compute, accumulate data, and then flood the network with data. And in those cases, it's possible during those short periods of time to saturate the network. The problem with network saturation is that, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, a simulation uh, on a factory um, don't ask me for the details about the sizes, relatively size, uh, fat, uh, large fat tree. But the issue is that we are running the network at uniform constant load. And the network is close to saturation. And at some point in time, we start to inject some additional hotspot traffic. The problem is that not only during the time, you can see here this between the, the two uh, uh, blue uh, vertical lines, not only during this time performance drops dramatically, but even once we remove the hotspot traffic and we leave traffic that the network was able to handle, the, neighbor, the, the network is no longer able to handle that amount of traffic. Performance has degraded permanently. The network is later able to recover partially, but not completely. So this is very important. It may be the case that we saturate the network and performance drops dramatically and the network may never recover and, until we dramatically reduce uh, injection load. Okay? So this is very important to keep uh, in mind. I will later explain the, the reasons for this. So should we uh, care about congestion? Well, uh, the issue is that on the one hand, uh, processors are faster and faster and uh, also uh, links uh, need to be faster in order to, to handle all the, all the data generated by processors and, and send them uh, to other uh, nodes. And therefore, the power consumed by the interconnection network increases. It's not like a processor where generation after generation with improved VLSI techniques, transistors are smaller and, most importantly, closer to each other. And therefore, with less power, we can transfer data. However, this is not the case for the interconnect. If you look at the size of the rack, uh, of a rack today and a rack 10 years ago, it's roughly the same size. And therefore, the distance between different nodes is roughly the same. So if we increase frequency, we need to increase power consumption for the interconnect. Uh, as I mentioned before, as, as uh, processor prices drop, and then the relative uh, cost of the interconnect increases. So we, no, we should no longer overdimension the interconnection network. That leads uh, to a smaller network, and uh, the excess power consumption will sooner or later lead to incorporating power management techniques in the interconnection network itself, not just the processors. When that happens, then uh, bandwidth will decrease, either because uh, the network has been dimensioned of a smaller size or because uh, the power management techniques deactivate some components. When that happens, then it will be much easier to raise the saturation point. In other words, we will disable some or will uh, turn off some components in the interconnection network in order to save power. That means that the working point will move towards the saturation point, and since traffic is bursty, some of those bursts may saturate the network. So at that point, congestion will grow, and performance will degrade, as I previously shown. So we really need congestion management strategies. So what are the benefits of incorporating uh, congestion management techniques? Well, the first one is that we'll have a network with stable performance when it reaches the saturation point. So if traffic is bursting, we cannot dimension the network for the maximum peak, for the top peak in traffic, very much like a hi-fi equipment. No, this is not the case. That would be too expensive. So we dimension the network so that it can handle uh, all the traffic on average, but it may be the case that for some birds, the network will saturate. So we want to have stable performance once the network reaches saturation. Uh, 
An example of uh, saturation is when uh, you implement a barrier and all the processors need to send uh, data, or at least signal, to one of the nodes to say, hey, I raised the barrier. So that pattern, that communication pattern, many to one or all to one, will necessarily saturate the network if all of the nodes happen to reach the barrier at the same time. And this is unavoidable. You are not going to dimension a network that's n times faster, where n is the number of nodes, simply to handle this case. That makes no sense. So there will be a few cases where the network will saturate. So we want to have stable network performance without the degradation I previously shown whenever the network reaches saturation. The other issue is that uh, we want uh, the network to react uh, quickly when power management uh, deactivates some components. You know that once you deactivate some links, then uh, they cannot be immediately reactivated. It takes some, some cycles to reactivate them because you have to power them on and then you have to synchronize transmitter and receiver until the PLL at the destination uh, is synchronized with the transmission frequency. The link cannot be operated and therefore you would like to be able to, to have some other mechanism that could immediately react whenever traffic increases. So from the time traffic increases until you can reactivate some links you previously disabled to save power, you would like something to happen to avoid performance degradation. And this is again congestion management. And uh, another issue is that, uh, well, in, in large interconnects, uh, failures may occur. And in those cases, there are uh, mechanisms like, for instance, uh, automatic path migration in InfiniBand to handle those situations and be able to uh, send traffic uh, through other alternative paths. But this, uh, this is good, but at the same time, the fact that some components failed means that there is less bandwidth available across the whole interconnect. And if the network was running close to saturation, it may be the case that after the failure, some regions in the network reach saturation. And not for short periods of time, but for relatively long periods of, uh, of time, simply because there is no longer enough bandwidth to handle all the traffic. In those cases, we would like the network to remain working at the maximum throughput in a stable manner without performance degradation until the components could be repaired or replaced. Okay, so. In all of those situations, uh, the networks can significantly benefit from having some congestion management mechanism. Now let me quickly introduce some, uh, some concepts so that you better understand the strategies and, and how they work. Basically, uh, when se there are uh, several components, I don't know whether they've got the near laser pointer. No. <laughs> um, so when, when uh, there are several nodes that want to send traffic through an interconnection network. This is a partial view of the interconnection network, just a few switches where several nodes on the left send traffic to some destination that's connected to some port on the right. So when, when several uh, flows happen to uh, request the same output port, then there is contention. Thank you very much. So uh, when several flows try to use the same output port, then there is contention. In that case, there is an arbiter here, some packets uh, continue while some packets wait in the buffers. And this is the role of the, the buffers. Fantastic. But if this situation persists, then uh, we end up filling the buffers because uh, the bandwidth provided by this link is lower than the, the sum of the bandwidth of those two links, and therefore will end up filling those buffers. Since the, the network is, is a lossless interconnect, then the flow control mechanism will notify the sender nodes or the sender switches to stop sending packets because there is no room for them. And this situation will end up propagating to the, uh, up to the sources, okay? Until it reaches the source nodes and the source nodes will again uh, stop injecting packets because the buffers are full. The issue is that there, well, when, when we consider this uh, back pressure situation, there is no congestion management technique that could improve the situation. I mean, 
Back pressure simply uh, notifies the sources of the availability of resources, and if there are no more resources, it's impossible to send packets. So there is nothing better we can do. We are using the network at the peak bandwidth it can deliver for this particular traffic pattern. So what's the problem? The real problem is that there could be other nodes that would like to send traffic somewhere else, not to this uh, congested port, but somewhere else. And those, traffic, uh, those flows are affected by the congestion produced by other flows. This is the real problem. The fact that there are some other uh, nodes that would like to use part of the path, and regardless of the fact that they are not going to the congested point, they suffer congestion because they share some of the links in the network. This is known as head of line blocking. Okay, so this is the real problem, not the congestion itself, but the head of line blocking. So let's analyze the, the structure of a congestion tree. In a congestion tree, just to use some uh, notation, some terminology, there is the root of the congestion tree. Then uh, there are flows that contribute to the congestion. And these are congestion tree branches. And finally, uh, if congestion, the congestion tree reaches the source nodes, we'll have the leaves of the congestion tree. So what are the solutions to address uh, congestion? The, the simplest one, the one that has been uh, used for decades, is to overdimension the interconnection network. We could have a network for connecting those nodes so that uh, four nodes are attached to a switch and share the bandwidth provided by that switch. And if we want to increase the bandwidth provided by the interconnection, we reduce the number of components attached to that switch until we reach the, the limit of just one uh, node uh, attached to its switch. Okay? These are usually known as uh, direct networks, but this is the, the limit uh, you can reach with this configuration so as to provide the maximum bandwidth. Obviously, here there are many more components than here, and therefore the network will be more expensive, but will also deliver higher bandwidth. When we overdimension the interconnection network, if this is the latency traffic uh, plot, well, this is not completely flat, but almost flat, until we uh, approach saturation where uh, latency increases dramatically. Well, if we work in this, in this zone, in this area, where latency is almost constant, we, we can deliver low latency, and if there are uh, traffic birds, we'll move in this area, but without reaching saturation. If, on the other hand, we were working here in this area, uh, any small burst would saturate the network. Okay, so if we overdimension the network, we work in this area at the expense of, obviously, a more expensive interconnect. Other congestion management techniques. Well, uh, there is um, another congestion technique that based on um, preventing congestion. Basically, if we know traffic characteristics, we allocate some resources before transmitting data, and then we start transmission. This is uh, usually used in, uh, for quality of service and was uh, implemented in uh, network technologies like ATM. The problem with this is that it produces significantly high overhead as well as high setup latencies, and therefore this is not suitable for, uh, for HPC applications. Another traditional congestion management technique, which is the, the one currently implemented in InfiniBand, is uh, what's generally called co uh, congestion recovery uh, techniques, uh, where the basic idea is that if there is congestion anywhere in the switch uh, fabric, uh, there are some ways of detecting that congestion, for instance, because some, uh, some queues uh, reach certain threshold. And once the, that uh, congestion is detected, it should be notified to the sources. Uh, if possible, not to all the sources, but the one, to the ones really contributing to congestion. And then those sources throttle injection, and once they reduce the injection rate, then they adjust the injection rate to the maximum bandwidth available at the most congested point in the network. Once they do so, then the congestion disappears. So that's basically the idea. The problem with those strategies is that they don't scale very well. They don't scale well simply because uh, if you analyze how it works, it's necessary to detect congestion at a certain point in the network 
and propagate that notification to the sources. And that takes some time. That's a pure delay. If uh, you happen to have studied uh, closed-loop control systems, you will know that closed-loop control systems with a pure delay in the feedback chain are very difficult to stabilize, are among the, the most difficult ones to, to handle. And this is what happens here. And the problem is that that delay increases as we scale the network. If we scale the number of nodes, if we increase the number of nodes, we'll need a larger number of stations for a given switch size. And therefore, we'll need a uh, longer time to propagate the notifications back to the source. Additionally, if we increase the clock frequency, the link transmission rate, for a given period of time, the network will transmit many more packets and will fill uh, larger buffers. And therefore, by the time the sources receive the first notification about the congestion situation, they have transmitted a lot of packets and therefore draining uh, such a large congestion tree will take longer. So it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to uh, handle those situations as, as we increase the size of the, the network. I'm not saying that it doesn't work, it works. But it's increasingly difficult to tune as we increase the size of the, uh, of the switch fabric. And if we want to be uh, very aggressive, it may produce oscillations. And indeed, many people who have tried those congestion management mechanisms have observed those oscillations in, in the traffic. Oscillations mean that you reach saturation, and then you drop the injection rate below the one tolerated by the network, and therefore you are introducing bubbles. And that means that you are wasting bandwidth. Well, um, as I mentioned before, basically, if congestion arises at some point, that's detected, notified to the destination, in the case for, uh, for InfiniBand, the destination uh, sends an acknowledgement back to the sources contributing to congestion, and when they receive this notification, they have a table and they start to move a pointer down that table, uh, progressively reducing the, the injection rate. Other approaches. Well, some people claim that adaptive routing could be used for um, eliminating congestion. This is not the case. Congestion routing may, uh, sorry, adaptive routing may help. May help when not all the network is saturated. If only a fraction of the network is saturated, it's possible to avoid that congested area by using adaptive routing. But only if just a fraction of the network is saturated and if the root of the congestion drain of the congestion trees within the switch fabric. If the root of the congestion tree is at some end node, adaptive routing doesn't help at all. The only thing it does is to spread congestion across many more links and many more paths. But it, it, it cannot solve the, the, the problem simply because the, the bandwidth at the receiving point at the, at the end node is limited and it's lower than the one required by all the senders. Okay? Another possible solution is packet dropping. But I, as I mentioned before, packet dropping is not a good idea in, uh, for HPC. So what are the challenges? Well, it would be interesting to, to be able to develop congestion management techniques that react locally and immediately. By locally, I mean, hey, guys, you detected congestion here, react here, and do something immediately. Don't wait until the notification reaches the sources and they throttle injection. No, no, I want an immediate and local reaction to address the problem so that it doesn't affect other flows that go anywhere else. That would be a nice property of congestion management techniques. Another uh, nice feature would be that they are, they are really scalable. I mean, as we increase the number of nodes, they could really scale and not being so much affected by those increasingly long notification delays. And they are not so much affected by those oscillations. It would be nice to, to be able to achieve coordination between different uh, sources contributing to congestion without any data exchange uh, among them. You may think that this is impossible, but as, uh, I'll show you later, uh, there is at least one mechanism that, that can do this. Obviously, uh, we would like to eliminate those instabilities and oscillatory responses I mentioned before. That can be easily done by uh, reducing the speed at which the, the uh, congestion management techniques react. So if we uh, set, them, set the parameters for a slower reaction, we can eliminate the, the oscillations. 
However, it will react more slowly, and we want immediate reaction. So mm, it's kind of contradictory. So we'd like to have both of them. Well, there are obviously we would like to minimize the number of resources, and if possible, we would like to make that compatible with adaptive routing, so that we could get the benefits of adaptive routing and the benefits of congestion management. Is it possible to have all of those? I believe it's possible. So let me tell you how to um, improve the, the existing congestion management techniques. If we consider um, the congestion management techniques in currently implemented InfiniBand, you know that in InfiniBand, whenever congestion is uh, detected at some uh, output port, because uh, key occupancy reaches some threshold, the notification is not directly transmitted to the sources. Instead, packets uh, contributing to congestion are marked with some second bit, and when they reach the destination, the corresponding acknowledgement is marked with a beacon bit, and when that acknowledgement with a beacon bit reaches the source, the source knows that the, the packet uh, associated with that particular acknowledgement has been contributing to congestion. Has been contributing to congestion, and therefore it should start reducing injection rate in order to eliminate congestion. So this is the, the, the work. It, it, the, the way it works. But the problem is that in, under certain situations, the reaction is the opposite to the one we would like to have. For instance, you consider that there are several nodes contributing to congestion at congestion occurs so somewhere, either at the end node or somewhere within the, the switch fabric. At this point in time, what happens when there is a new contributor? If there is a new contributor, obviously the bandwidth across the most saturated link will be shared among all the contributors, and if there is a new contributor, the share of the bandwidth for the existing contributors will drop, because there is a new contributor that also consumes some of the bandwidth. So the bandwidth for the existing contributors will drop. And if it drops, the rate at which we mark packets with a second bit will also drop. And when, those, when the corresponding acknowledgments go back to the sources, the source will say, hey, now the rate of beacon bits is dropping. Congestion is vanishing. Well, fantastic. Let me increase the injection rate. When indeed it should do the contrary, because there are new contributors and the share of the bandwidth is smaller. So there are a few cases where existing mechanisms react in the opposite way as we would like them to, to react. So how, how can we take care of this? Well, the, at least in, in theory, the, the concept is quite simple. What we would like to have is Consider the situation where when packets cross the, the, the most congested link and only the most congested link, we mark all of them. So the marking rate is 100%. We mark all the packets. When the corresponding acknowledgments go back to the source and they re get a, a beacon bit, an acknowledgement with a beacon bit set, then they will inject a new packet every time they receive an acknowledgement. So there is a one-to-one -one relationship. Well, uh, let me clarify something. Uh, they are allowed to inject a packet of the same size as the one corresponding to that acknowledgement. So keep in, in mind that packets could have different sizes. But uh, you know what I mean. Basically, for every packet of certain size that was transmitted and crossed the most congested link and we received the acknowledgement with the beacon bit, we inject the corresponding amount. Why? The reason is very simple. When packets from different sources are sharing a given uh, link, if this is the root of the congestion tree, they are sharing the bandwidth of that link. And the rate at which packets are marked is exactly the same rate at which different contributors to the congestion are getting a share of that bandwidth. So we get an information, an accurate information of the share for each contributor across the acknowledgements it gets back. So if we continue injecting packets exactly at the same rate we receive acknowledgements, we are injecting packets exactly at the same share of the bandwidth of the most congested link for that particular source. And if we do so, we will neither contribute to increase the size of the congestion tree nor to making it disappear it will be a stable situation. If we want the congestion tree to disappear, we simply reduce 
this rate slightly, for instance, uh, we inject nine packets out of ten acknowledgements, for instance, and this way the, the size of the congestion tree will, will drop slowly, will, will reduce, will, will shrink slowly. So this is the basic idea. Now, if there is a new contributor, there is another guy contributing to congestion, then the, the share of the bandwidth for the existing contributors will drop, the rate at which they receive beacon bits will also drop, and they will reduce the injection rate. So it's possible to automatically adjust the bandwidth or the injection rate for each of the contributors to exactly the share of the bandwidth they get across the most congested link. Key, key points for doing so is that we have to distinguish the root of the congestion tree from the remaining links in the network, but fortunately this is something that uh, uh, is already implemented in, in existing switches. For instance, Melanox implements uh, such a mechanism. So that's already available and we can use that mechanism. And in doing so, we can adjust uh, the, the injection rate this way instead of using the, the existing tables and we will be able to uh, handle the congestion situations much more efficiently. Obviously, the, 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 the full picture is a bit more complex because uh, we have to uh, distinguish transient congestion from permanent congestion. Assuming that it's permanent congestion, the best thing we can do when we receive the first beacon uh, is to completely drop injection rate down to zero so as to drain most of the congestion tree as fast as possible. And once we have done so, then we'll continue injecting at the rate I mentioned before so that the congestion tree continues reducing at a slow rate until it completely disappears. And once it has done so, we should not increase the injection rate back to full bandwidth, but instead we should keep the same injection rate we had when we received the last acknowledgement uh, with a beacon bit set and then increase it very slowly. This is work that has been uh, done in collaboration with uh, similar research labs and is delivering uh, very good results. Hopefully someday you will find them in, uh, in commercial switches. So, um, there are uh, some uh, other uh, techniques. For instance, can we combine, uh, before moving to other techniques, can we combine congestion management and adaptive routing? Well, the answer is positive. Let me give you the, the basic ideas. Basically, what we would like to do is uh, to use adaptive routing only when it's beneficial and uh, forget about adaptive routing when it uh, may contribute to increase the, 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 the congestion. So how do we distinguish those situations? Well, it's very simple. We should never use adaptive routing if the root of the congestion tree is at an end node. Because if the congestion is at an end node, using adaptive routing will simply spread congestion across the, the whole switch fabric. It will not help at all. We'll congest many more paths. If, on the other hand, the congestion, the most congested point, the root of the congestion tree, is within the switch fabric, then it makes sense using adaptive routing, provided that there are alternative paths to destination that don't go through the root of the congestion tree. So that's the key idea. Okay? More research is needed in order to, to be able to uh, clearly identify both situations and, and uh, use adaptive routing in the most convenient way. But this is the basic idea to benefit from adaptive routing when there is congestion. Now, let's move to uh, another completely different uh, set of uh, techniques. I'm going over there, uh, over them in, in quite quickly, uh, and I will just present the, the basic idea and we'll show an animation on, on how it works. The key idea is that, as I mentioned before, once we got a congestion tree, if there was no head of line blocking, simply the network is delivering the best it can. I mean, there is certain bandwidth, there is a, a link that is oversubscribed, uh, there is more demand than available bandwidth, and the network is using that link at 100% of the bandwidth. So this is the best the network can do. Nothing wrong. Unless you overdimension the network, there is nothing better you can do. The problem is that there is head of line blocking, as I mentioned before. So if we manage to eliminate head of line blocking, we are indeed eliminating all the negative consequences of congestion. And that would be enough to, to, to solve the problem. We would get the maximum performance even if the congestion tree is still there. 
as long as we could manage to eliminate all the head of line blocking. So by el eliminating head of line blocking, congestion becomes kind of harmless, and uh, we can do so by allocating separate buffers for congested flows. So the key idea is at a given port, uh, I don't know whether you prefer input buffer, output buffer uh, switches, whatever you have. So let's assume that you are using input buffer switches. At every input port, in addition to the, the existing buffers, you add some extra buffers so that you could have, uh, use them as set-aside buffers. Whenever you detect the flow as, as contributing to congestion, you move that flow to those set-aside buffers and allow the remaining traffic to use the standard buffers. If you do so, you are completely eliminating head of line blocking. So this is the basic idea, to completely separate traffic contributing to congestion from the remaining traffic. Once you do so, head of line blocking is completely eliminated. You may still say, hey, wait a moment. Uh, if you just remove the, the traffic contributing to congestion and move it to separate buffers, still all the remaining flows are still mixed in the standard buffers, and they may introduce head of line blocking. No. As long as they don't stop, they don't introduce any significant head of line blocking. Okay? So if we remove all the congested flows and move them to separate buffers, the problem disappears. So let me, let me show you how uh, head of line blocking contributes to uh, reducing uh, performance. Here you have uh, three contributors to this uh, congestion tree. You can see the red packets here, and they are uh, all of them uh, addressed to destination one. In that case, uh, since uh, the, the bandwidth of this link is whatever it is, let's say 100% as uh, relative measure, and assuming that the arbiter here is a round-robin arbiter that doesn't assign any higher priority to any of them, each of them will get 33% of the bandwidth. Okay, fine, this is the best the network can do. But now this other guy uh, wants to send packets to destination two, and it shares this link with one of the congestion uh, tree branches. And that's the problem. Because the scheduler here doesn't know about that situation, and using round robin, it will assign the same bandwidth to this flow and to this flow. And in doing so, we'll transmit one packet from here, one packet from here. Okay, alternatively. So, uh, in this case, since this is getting 33% of the bandwidth because it's limited by this link, this will also get 33% of the bandwidth. Okay, so this is the, the problem and this is why at this point in time this link is only using 60% uh, of the bandwidth and you will only get 33% of the bandwidth here when you could indeed get 66%. So that's, that's uh, the, the problem introduced uh, when, when you have head of line blocking. Let me skip this. Uh. So techniques to address this. Well, there are several techniques proposed in the literature. Um, one of them, I'm sure you have heard about virtual output queuing. Virtual output queuing addresses this problem at the switch level. And basically, it implements separate queues for each output port. So by not mixing traffic going to the different destinations, you eliminate head of line blocking. You can extend that to the whole switch fabric. So you can implement virtual output queuing at the network level. And that means that for every input port of every switch, you will have to implement as many separate queues as destinations in the whole switch fabric. Yes, it's extremely expensive, I know. But it works. It works and it completely eliminates head of line blocking. But obviously this is, this is not affordable. In a large interconnection network, that would be extremely expensive. And therefore it's, it's, not, it's not a viable solution. However, it gives us some idea on, on, on the kind of things that could be done and that work uh, correctly. Well, this is the same at the... Uh, at the switch level, virtual output queuing, and finally some people propose to use virtual channels, especially combined with one-hole switching. Um, so techniques that basically uh, split traffic into separate buffers so as to reduce the impact of uh, head of line blocking. Uh, we also worked on those topics and tried to uh, find out whether it's possible to get most of the benefits of virtual output queuing without the cost of full virtual output queuing. I mean, instead of implementing, for instance, at the switch level, instead of implementing as many queues as output ports in a given switch, 
What happens if we implement just four, eight buffers at each input port in a switch with, say, 36 ports? Can we handle those buffers in a way that we get most of the benefits of virtual output queuing without the cost of full virtual output queuing? The answer is positive. Just with a convenient mapping functions so that for a subset of the destinations, we map those packets to a certain buffer. For another subset, we map them to another buffer and so on. We can split traffic according to destinations. And if there is congestion in traffic going to a certain destination, only the packets sharing the same buffer will suffer head of line blocking. All the remaining ones will not, will not suffer uh, head of line blocking. So we can significantly alleviate head of line blocking simply by mapping packets appropriately to those buffers. And we have uh, proposed several techniques. Uh, one of them, the, the one that seems to work better, is this one. Basically, consider a switch with 36 ports and with only, say, uh, four buffers for each input port. In that case, we can select uh, the buffer this way, uh, the requested output port modulo uh, the number of queues. So we, if we got four queues, then we take the requested output port at that switch modulo uh, four, and that's the number of the queue where we will store that packet. By doing so, we can segregate traffic into classes so that each class doesn't affect the other one. Well, that's nice in theory, and you run simulations and that works wonderfully well, however, the, the, the practical situation would be significantly different. And why? Simply because when you run a parallel application, that parallel application, let's assume a really huge parallel application with huge data sets that requires all the nodes in the machine. If your application re requires uh, traffic from different nodes to other nodes in order to run all the processes without uh, having to stop any of them, if it happens that certain part of the interconnection network is congested, it doesn't matter we constrain head of line blocking to just a subset of the destinations. Those destinations will suffer head of line blocking. Some messages will arrive later than usual, and that will delay the execution of the corresponding processes. That will likely affect the whole application sooner or later. So this is not a final solution. But it gives us some, some clues on, on how to proceed. Well, these are just some, uh, um, well, some simulation results that show that uh, with uh, this technique, with just a fraction of the, uh, of the uh, number of buffers you require for virtual output queuing, you get the same performance as virtual output queuing. Uh, that's just for uniform traffic. As I mentioned before, this is not representative of what happens in, in, uh, when running a parallel application. <clears throat> so, in order to improve that, uh, we have developed some uh, more sophisticated techniques based on the same principle, but with higher sophistication so that we could dynamically address all the problems uh, produced by uh, congestion trees. What we have done is the following. Well, the first technique, Recon, was developed for a technique that, well, technology that already disappeared, advanced switching interconnects. Uh, some of you may have heard about it. And the main difference between this uh, technology and InfiniBand is that that technology used short routing. That means that each and every packet had some information in the header that contained not information about the destination, but information about the particular path it had to follow until reaching the destination. So it contained information about the output port that had to be selected at each intermediate hope in the network. And that was useful in order to, um, to know the relative address of the congestion points with respect to the place where each packet was stored at that point in time. So it was relatively easy to know the relative addresses of the root of the congestion trees uh, with respect to the, the switches where packets were, uh, were being routed at that, at that point in time. Well, anyway, let me basically explain you the ideas on, on how it works, because it can be later extended for uh, technologies with destination-based routing like InfiniBand. Um, let me show you a graphical 
uh, description on, on how it works. Let's consider some uh, switch fabric with some uh, source nodes, some destination nodes. Obviously, this, these nodes are the same ones as these ones. Simply, uh, here we consider the injection port, and here we consider the uh, delivery port. Okay, but this, this computer is the same as this one. So, let's assume that there are two flows that go to the same destination, and there is not enough bandwidth at that link in order to handle all the traffic because these guys are sending at maximum rate. In that case, the corresponding queue, at, uh, let's assume that the, 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 the switches have input and output buffers. It could be without output buffers, no problem, but just to, to uh, simplify, let's assume that there are output buffers. Sooner or later, that queue will fill over a certain threshold simply because it cannot send packets at the same rate it's receiving from both inputs. You may say, well, it's impossible for this queue to fill because uh, now he here there is a switch. Well, remember that uh, some commercial switches have some internal speed up so that they can transfer packets from input to output ports faster than this port can transmit over the corresponding link. So assuming some internal speed up, this is feasible. So when the queue fills over a certain threshold, we detect congestion. In that case, what we do is we don't mark packets. Instead, we wait for packets from input ports to arrive to that output port. And when this input port send packets requesting uh, that output port, we send notifications saying, hey, guy, uh, I reached congestion status, so you should take care of this. And then this other input port also sends some uh, packet here and receives the same notification. I'm congested. So input ports receiving those notifications allocate separate buffers, those set aside queues I mentioned before, and start to store the incoming traffic leading to that congested port into those separate uh, set-aside queues. Those set-aside queues, sooner or later, will fill over certain threshold, simply because there isn't enough bandwidth here. The congestion tree is forming. And then they will send notification to upstream switches, sending packets uh, to those buffers, saying that, hey, I had to allocate the set-aside buffer, and now my set-aside buffer is becoming full. So please do the same. Please move. Uh, this congested traffic uh, aside. And they do so. They allocate the corresponding uh, set-aside buffers. And those set-aside buffers will receive all the traffic going to those destinations separately from the remaining uh, traffic. And we continue this way until we eventually reach the source nodes, okay? So this way, we have built a tree, not only a congestion tree, but a tree of set-aside buffers, so that those set-aside buffers store all the congested flows and separate them from the remaining traffic so that they don't introduce any head of line blocking. It's important to take into account that uh, we separate that uh, that traffic in that way, and the remaining traffic can share the remaining queues without any significant head of line blocking. Now, if there is another flow from a different source to a different destination that happened to share some of the links, that traffic will use the standard buffers, not the set-aside buffers. It will use the standard buffers, and therefore, it will not be affected by head of line blocking. So this way, we can react immediately, locally, and additionally propagate those notifications so as to keep allocating resources across the entire congestion tree and therefore completely eliminating head of line blocking. In, in the original technique, it was possible to, to send those notifications quite easily because since we had uh, the entire path across the, the switch fabric in every packet, it was possible to compute the relative address of this congested port with respect to, for instance, this output port, because that was part of the path in those packets. Uh, 
let me skip this because these are details for that technique. Now we have extended that idea uh, to distributed routing, to networks where packets do not contain the path, but instead they contain just the destination, just the, the, the destination for each of the packets. So uh, how do we handle this situation? Well, uh, the way we initially handled it, it was, uh, I would say, an academic solution, not a practical one, where for each input port we had uh, the non-congested uh, flow queue, that's the, the standard queue for, uh, well, there could be um, several of them, but this is uh, one of the queues for non-congested flows. And for congested flows we had several um, additional queues, as well as uh, a CAM, a content addressable memory, so that we could store information about congested flows. And that information is stored at every input port. In every input port we have some RAM, and part of that RAM is devoted to non-congested flows, and the rest of the RAM is devoted to congested flows. And we have this CAM structure to store information about congested packets. Yes, uh, we need several queues for each queue, and that means that most of the buffer area will be devoted to congested flows. I will address that later, okay? But in the original technique, that, that had to be uh, this way. And this is the information we had to store in the CAM lines. Among other things, we had to store a destination list. That means that if a given congested flow uh, goes to a certain destination and the root of the congestion tree uh, is at some end node, that destination list is just that destination, just one field. Wonderful. However, if the root of the congestion tree is within the switch fabric and from that congested point it's possible to reach many destinations, we had to fill that list with all the possible destinations. That was a nice academic solution, but it's not a practical one. So what do we do uh, in order to reduce that, the size of that information? Well, in practice, you implement certain topologies, for instance, a FAT tree. FAT trees use certain routing algorithms, and a given switch output port can only send packets to a certain subset of destinations in the switch fabric. And it happens that those destinations are either consecutive or are separated with certain stride. So the only thing we need to store is initial destination, final destination, and stride, only three fields. With that information, we perfectly identify where the, congestion, the root of the congestion tree is located within the switch fabric. Okay? So it's a relatively uh, compact information. Well, let, let me skip the simulation, because this is basically what I showed you before, but uh, with only two switches. And Obviously, the, the simulation results uh, show that uh, you get the same throughput with uh, virtual output queuing at the network level or any of these techniques that use just a small fraction of the buffers required by uh, virtual output queuing at the network level. With virtual output queuing at the network level, you, you need, as I mentioned before, as many buffers per input port as end nodes in the switch fabric. However, with, with our techniques, you only need, uh, depending on the size of the switch fabric, from four to eight buffers. Still too many, okay, but a much smaller number than uh, as many as, as end nodes. These are some other simulations for uh, real traces from, from uh, parallel applications where you can see that the behavior is, is roughly the same uh, for the different techniques. So, can we in some way get the, be the, the best of both worlds? Can we get the best? of techniques like the reactive techniques implemented in InfiniBand and these techniques based on elimination of head-of-line blocking, the answer is positive. We can combine both mechanisms and get the best of both worlds. And in doing so, we get several benefits. First of all, by combining react, uh, reactive uh, congestion management strategies with these techniques to eliminate head-of-line blocking, it turns out that we no longer need, say, 4, 8, 12, additional set-aside queues for allocating no, um, congested flows. We just need one extra buffer per input port to store congested flows. And the reason is very simple. When we just had techniques to eliminate head-of-line blocking, 
we had to take care of all the possible concurrent overlapping congestion trees that could appear in the network. When we combine this technique with reactive uh, congestion management techniques, as soon as a congestion tree appears, there is an immediate and local reaction at the switch by allocating a set-aside queue and separated con congested flows from the remaining traffic. But since now notifications are sent to the sources, the sources react and reduce injection rates so that the congestion tree is eliminated. So the previously allocated set-aside buffer can now be released and make it ready for the next congestion tree that will appear. Okay, so by combining both techniques, we reduce the need for extra buffers to just one extra queue per input port. So that's quite doable in, in commercial systems. The other benefit we get is that I mentioned before uh, some oscillations in reactive congestion management techniques when um, those techniques are tuned to react as, uh, as fast as possible. Now, since we react immediately at every switch, there is no need for reacting so fast. And indeed, we can tune reactive congestion management techniques to react more slowly so as to eliminate those oscillations, simply because now there is no hurry. There is another technique that takes care of completely eliminating head of line blocking immediately. So by combining both techniques, we get the best of both worlds. And with little extra cost, it should be possible to completely eliminate all the problems introduced by uh, congestion and keep the performance stable at the maximum throughput every time traffic exceeds the saturation point. Okay? So basically, that concludes my talk. These are the, the conclusions. I, I'm not going to repeat them, but this is kind of summary of the, the presentation. Any questions? Ah, before that, uh, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of one of my former PhD students who developed most of the research uh, presented here as well as uh, part, uh, prepare part of the, the slides in this presentation, and also to a similar research lab um, with uh, whom we are uh, collaborating for, for several years. And uh, this late, latest technique uh, I mentioned has been developed in collaboration with him. Thank you. <laughs>